Good morning, everybody. I'd like to introduce you to the Low CVP and Advanced Propulsion Centre's Life Cycle Analysis and Sustainability webinar series. Uh, my name is Gloria Esposito. I'm Head of Projects at the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership. Today is our first webinar and the focus will be on vehicle production and I'm very pleased to have a range of expert speakers. Uh, we have Jane Patterson uh, from Ricardo, we have Dr. Will Jury uh, from the Industrial Strategy Fund, Dr. Stuart Coles from WMG and Professor Claire Davis also from WMG. I'd like to pass over now to, to Philippa that will give us um, an overview of some of the housekeeping for today. Thanks, Gloria. Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted you can join us today. So my name is um, Philippa Oldham. I'm head of the National Network Programmes at the Advanced Propulsion Centre. And as um, with any event we do, there always has to be a little bit of housekeeping. Um, hopefully you will know where your nearest uh, exits are in your, own, in your own house or at where, wherever you are. Um, and, and if your fire alarm is going off, please feel free to leave your own house. But from our side of things, um, we would um, just to let you know, all your cameras and your microphones are disabled by us um, throughout the session. Um, we would be delighted for you to add your questions and answers um, to any of the speakers in the Q&A box, actually, which you will find um, at the bottom of your, of your screen. Um, with this, if you could um, let us know if it's directed towards a particular panellist or speaker, that would be fantastic. Um, we encourage you to use the chat function um, to have any sort of um, disco discussion about the topics um, or if you have any um, other, other queries or questions to keep that going. We will be recording all of the sessions this week, so if you can't make um, all of them, uh, feel free to log on at a later date and watch some videos. Um, we want to encourage everyone to be social um, throughout the event. So on any of the social media channels that you're on, please feel free to use the hashtag um, LCA week. Um, and at the end of the um, session today, we will be um, providing you with a short survey monkey um, to get your feedback on the speakers um, and what you thought of the event. Gloria, back to you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm very delighted now to introduce um, our keynote speaker. Um, this is Jane Patterson. Technology Strategy Consultant at Ricardo. Uh, Jane's going to be talking about life cycle greenhouse gas uh, emissions from vehicle production and wider sustainability impacts. Over to you, Jane. So hello to everybody. Um, as Gloria said, my name is Jane Patterson. I'm part of the technology strategy team at Ricardo Strategic Consulting, and I'm really delighted to be able to give this first presentation of today. And the title that I've been given is Life Cycle CO2 Equivalent Emissions from um, Electric Vehicle Production and Wider Sustainability Impacts. But before um, we get into that, um, let me just tell you a little bit more about the company that I work for in case there's anybody on the call today that hasn't um, heard of us before. Um, uh, I work for Ricardo. We are a global multi-industry, multi-discipline consultancy. So we're primarily doing work in lots of strategy and engineering and environmental consultancy services. For a service provider, we also do some niche manufacturer as well. We generally have high performance products. So gearboxes, transmissions, engines, and et cetera. Our, our portfolio of production keeps expanding. And we've been around for over 100 years and across that 100 year history, it's always been our objective to try and maximize efficiency and to eliminate waste in everything that we do. So whether that's back to the early days of diesel and gasoline internal combustion engines, through to the work that we're currently now doing on other kinds of propulsion systems, whether it's fuel cells and battery electric and um, hybrid, and also as we go um, beyond just road transport um, into rail, um, and thinking about mobility wider, sort of mobility as a service type. In terms of an organisation, we, um, although we're um, headquartered in the UK, we do now have a global footprint. We've got about 3,000 staff um, covering 88 different nationalities across 51 sites in 20 countries. So that's a little bit about Ricardo. Um, and within Ricardo, as we kind of do an accelerated transition, um, are we part of this accelerating transition towards net zero, 
we are um, looking at how we can adopt more of a life cycle thinking approach in terms of what we do and the kind of solutions that we deliver to our clients as we um, strive to create a world that's fit for the future. So in terms of what we'd like to talk about this morning is as we talk, think about the challenge of sustainability as it does shift from maybe just purely focusing on in use to thinking through about um, the emissions and the environmental impact of these different transport solutions over their whole life cycle. There's four things that I want us to go through today. So first is going to be um, just thinking about what is the challenge that we actually need to solve. The second is going to be kind of why, well, why do we need to adopt a life cycle approach to this challenge? We'll then take a little bit of a closer look at vehicle production and what are some of the environmental impacts that are happening in vehicle production and which vehicle systems are maybe contributing most to that. And then we'll finish by thinking a little bit of the trade-off. What is this trade-off between um, environmental um, impact of production versus in use? And when we might reach some of those sort of trade-off points. I'm just going to double check. Can everybody hear me okay? Is it still coming through okay in the audio? Gloria and Philippa, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. So in terms of the challenge, when we talk about sustainability, quite often what most people think about is environmental impact. And they're thinking about it, it needs to be sustainable in terms of we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And um, maybe if you're in a city council and you're worried about local air quality, you might be thinking about it in terms of how do we improve local air quality as well. And yes, there's been lots of talk about plastic over the last couple of years. But within Ricardo, whenever we talk about sustainability, we go wider than just Yes, environmental impact is an important aspect of it, but it's not the only thing that we have um, in this challenge of creating future sustainable transport. Because we also need to think about what the impacts are in terms of human health. And we also need to think about the economic well-being as well. Because if we're really going to come up and design and engineer um, a future transport system that is sustainable, it not only needs to balance, it needs to balance not impacting or minimising that impact on its environment and not adversely affecting people's health and moving people and goods in a cost-effective manner that maintains healthy economies as well. Because if the solution isn't going to be econo um, economically well, then it's not really going to survive in the market either. So these are the three things that we're sort of trying to balance together as we think about what the future solutions are going to be. So um, before we just think about it, why we would take a, li a life cycle approach, let me first just explain what life cycle is. So I'm sure there's many of you in the call today that are already very familiar with this. But for those for who maybe today's your first time that you've ever logged in to a life cycle assessment webinar, let me just um, explain a bit about what we mean by this. So life cycle assessment, it's a technique for taking a holistic approach to analysing the environmental impact over a product, over its whole or part of its life cycle. If you think about a product or a service, everything's got a life cycle. It's got a birth phase where it comes into being. It's got a use or a service phase, phase. And then it's got a death phase as well. It's got an end of life. And at each point along and that journey, it will impact on its environment, either positively or negatively. And life cycle assessment is just a technique for quantifying that environmental or human health impact over the product's life cycle. Um, other names that you might have heard of include life cycle analysis, um, taking a life cycle approach and um, doing some cradle to get analysis uh, or cradle to give, a grave and um, eco balance, or you might hear about environmental footprinting or environmental product declarations. And they're kind of generally referring to something quite similar. Um, and life cycle thinking is just about a way of thinking that includes the economic, environmental and social consequences of a product or a process by considering its whole life rather than maybe just what it might be in point of use. And uh, when we think about the life cycle of a vehicle, we generally end up kind of breaking it into sort of four blocks. So if I can just bring up the little laser pointer. There we go. So um, we would sort of think about it in terms of vehicle production. So this is encompassing um, preparing the materials, the extraction of the materials, so whether it's raw material or whether it's recycled material, through making the components to final assembly, and that vehicle effectively rolling off the end of a production line. And we would sort of count that all under the vehicle production. We then have the, the vehicle use or operation phase. 
So most of the environmental impact is going to happen when you're actually using your vehicle and it comes um, associated with the energy that it then uses. But there may also be some impacts from um, maintenance and service. But let's not forget that we've also got to think of why the production or the pathway of that fuel, how it's got to the vehicle. So whether that's a liquid fuel, a gaseous fuel, or whether it's electricity, um, it's going to have had some environmental impact associated with its production. So we need to think about that too. And then finally, our fourth block is thinking about the vehicle end of life and what might be the um, environmental impact um, at the end of the vehicle's life in terms of whether um, as it goes off for reuse and recycling. Um, and then if we sort of think about these blocks, so you might have heard some people talk about um, well-to-wheels analysis, which is thinking about the production of the fuels and the electricity. So that, if you like, is encompassing the fuel and electricity production and then also to the vehicle use as well. But it's not the only environmental impact that the vehicle has because it also impacts in terms of what we call um, the embedded, embedded emissions or some people refer to it as the embodied emissions. And this comes from things like the vehicle production. It comes from any impacts associated with maintenance and service. And it also then comes into the vehicle end of life as well. Um, so that's kind of in, in, yeah, the, the embedded emissions. And when you put the two together and wrap the whole big sort of block around it, that's when you're thinking about the whole um, life cycle and trying to assess what the environmental impact looks like as you think about all of these four blocks. So um, let's do that for an example. So um, these are just some numbers for illustration. But if we think about it, you usually when we think about doing the net zero challenge, we're thinking about reducing the environmental impact of the vehicle at its point of use. So let's think about, um, say, a European medium-sized passenger car, probably seat segment. And let's consider three different powertrain options. So let's um, think about it in terms of conventional and gasoline internal combustion engine. Let's think about it in terms of maybe having a, a plug-in hybrid version of that. And then finally, um, a battery electric. And if we think about it just in terms of point of use, and then we say we were to tot up all of the environmental impacts of that vehicle over its lifetime. So in this case, we've assumed a lifetime of say 2,225 thousand kilometers over, I think it's a sort of a 10 to 15 year period. We get numbers like this. So we're maybe getting something that's just north of say 40 tons of CO2 equivalent of greenhouse gas emissions over its lifetime. If you think about the gasoline plug-in hybrid, yes, it's less because part of its time is going to be in electric only mode, um, at which point it's not producing any tailpipe um, greenhouse gas emissions. But it is going to have some coming from whenever it's burning the fuel for whenever it's in that mode of operation. And then when we think about the battery electric, well, yes, it is zero at point of use, assuming that you're not including any, any, um, any impact from breaking and that kind of thing. Now if we were to then add in, well what about the um, embedded emissions that come from the electricity um, and if we're doing that then we need to do it for the, for the gasoline fuel as well and um, we're effectively adding in a bit of an extra block so this is where the slight blue block is coming from. So this is effectively if we were doing our wall to wheels numbers and we can see that our gasoline internal combustion engine, yes it goes up, uh, there's a bit more of a block from the, um, the environmental impact that's coming from the electricity from the battery electric and from the, um, the plug-in hybrid as well but there's still a lot less than the, the gasoline ICE. But now what happens if we think about the whole vehicle product LCA? So what if we add in those embedded emissions from vehicle production, from vehicle maintenance and from vehicle um, end of life? Well we might end up with something that looks a bit more like this. So yes, our gasoline is still the worst compared to the plug-in um, and to the battery electric. But do you notice how these grey bars here are a bit bigger than this grey bar up here? So what we're seeing here is, is if you like, a higher um, greenhouse gas emissions um, impact coming from the production of the electric versions versus the more conventional powertrain. And then we're going to look a bit later in this presentation about what that payback period might be to where we get that, that equivalent crossover point. But before we go into, into that, we also need to think about, well, it's not just greenhouse gas emissions. There are other environmental impact factors out there as well that maybe is worth us thinking about. 
So I've got um, three examples to show you today. There are only three. There are plenty of others that we could be thinking about. But um, what if we were to think about it in terms of um, sort of primary energy demand? So the amount of energy that we need to be able to have and operate this vehicle and um, thinking back to its primary sources. Well, the results look something a bit like this. And what about um, acidification potential? Um, well, here the story is maybe not quite so clear between the different options. And when we come to look at human toxicity, well, actually, it's slightly worse for the battery electric vehicle. A lot of this coming from things, I mean, the materials that are in that battery electric vehicle, so like the, the likes of the copper, etc. So as we move to thinking about things from a life cycle perspective, yes, hopefully you can see already why, why it's a good idea to do it. But let's not just get stuck on greenhouse gas emissions. Let's also be thinking about some of the other ways in which we impact on the environment as we, um, as we design and we develop alternative forms of propulsion. So let's now zoom in a bit more on the um, vehicle production, since that's the topic of this morning's talk. So do you remember that kind of grey bar that I showed you a few slides ago? Well, let's now look at that in terms of how it splits across, say, a range of different vehicle systems. So imagine that we can take our vehicle and we can divide it into, say, a vehicle glider. So this is basically all the normal propulsion bits. Um, let's group our engine and exhaust system together. For our plug-in um, and our battery electric, we're going to have an electric motor in there. And there's going to be a transmission system. There'll be some form of energy storage. Obviously, that varies depending on the type of propulsion system it is. And then let's also think about the power electronics. So if we do that and then do a split back again, this gives us a kind of an idea of the relative portions of the, um, of the different the three powertrains that we're looking at today. Um, so if you imagine this big kind of Ricardo blue bit, that's effectively a fixed number across these three different um, powertrain types because we've assumed for our study that we've got a common vehicle glider. And what you can see is that the vehicle glider is the most, um, it's a system that's contributing most across the three different propulsion systems that we've thought about. But as we bring in the battery and as the battery um, capacity gets bigger, so in, in this case we've assumed I think it was a 57 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack for the battery electric and an 11 um, kilowatt hour um, battery pack for the plug-in hybrid. You can see here that for the battery electric, we've ended up with a situation where we've got potentially 40% of the embedded emissions of the battery electric vehicle coming from the battery. So that is something for us to be aware of. And I'm gonna come in in a minute or two to just thinking about that trade-off between the um, embedded emissions from production versus the savings that you get in use. But let me pause a minute and just give you um, a slightly other way of thinking about this vehicle production as well. Because another reason for doing LCA is, is not only does it tell you which vehicle systems you maybe need to focus on in terms of trying to reduce your environmental impact, it also provides you with other information that maybe might surprise you and that might um, influence um, how you engage with different stakeholders um, when it comes to designing and developing your vehicle. So um, at Ricardo, as I mentioned earlier, we're not just a service provider, we're also, um, we also do niche production of high performance products. A couple of years ago, we thought, well, um, you know, we're talking about life cycle assessment. I've got some of my colleagues in Ricardo and Indian Environment where what they do is product LCA studies. And we've got this capability. And we thought, well, why don't we apply it to one of the products that, that, we, that we make and um, to one of the engines that we assemble and um, ensure and by sea? And we also wanted to try out um, a slightly more new for us um, LCA tool called EcoTurn as well. So um, we did what's known as a cradle to get study. So this is looking at the production of an engine. So thinking about its raw materials, the different components that are coming into the assembly line and then the production. Um, so we, um, yeah, we had the, sort of the information and the data available. We knew um, what components were coming in. We knew what materials they were made of. Um, we knew what um, the electricity bill and the gas bill was for the facility. So we used that to, um, to get a breakdown of what was contributing to the environmental um, impact, in this case, um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we got quite a bit, well, the result we got back surprised some of the engineers they were part of the project. Because when they started the project, 
they they were kind of think quite concerned about maybe the amount of rubbish or waste, the amount of packaging that um, that seems to be produced from making this engine, and they were concerned that that was going to have a high environmental impact. But actually, they were already having processes in place for being able to to kind of um, gather that together and send it off for recycling. And what they find was that in terms of what we at Ricardo within our assembly facility, what we effectively had control over in terms of the embedded emissions of the engine that we we're making. But actually it was quite a small little bit of the overall haul because most of the embedded and um, greenhouse gas emission impact was coming from the components that came into the assembly line. Not unsurprisingly, some of the, the heavier items, so the cylinder block and the cylinder head scored highest. Um, but what this taught us is that if we really wanted to um, try and attempt to reduce the environmental impact of the products that we were producing in terms of their embedded environmental impact, well, we would need to be engaging with our supply chain um, and that that might be a better way for us to achieve those gains rather than necessarily focusing on sort of further significant improvements in terms of our own energy efficiency. So um, that was one of the lessons that, that we learned from applying life cycle assessment within our own organisation. But let me um, take you back to the, the other kind of example that I was showing to you a few slides ago. So our European medium-sized passenger car, our C segment, operating somewhere in Europe. And as we said, sorry, excuse me. So, um, do you remember we said about the, um, excuse me, <coughs> Remember we said about the um, embedded emissions um, from vehicle production, that it was higher for our battery electric than it was for our, our um, normal gasoline ICE. So if we plot them a little bit like this, you can get an idea of the relative difference. And one of the questions that, some com that sometimes comes up is, well, how long would it take you to sort of pay back this um, embedded environmental impact that you're causing at production? So I'm going to confess this is slightly crude, but let's, Let's see what happens when I click the button. So this is now the vehicle sort of running through and um, their life. Um, and for this particular use scenario with the um, energy and the environmental impacts associated with energy, what we find is we get a crossover point between and the plug-in vehicle and the conventional vehicle at less than 2,000 kilometers. Between the conventional and gasoline and the battery electric, we get a crossover at about 3,000 kilometres. And then between the PHEV and the battery electric, we get another crossover around 90,000 kilometres. Now, I ought to put a really big caveat on this. This is really sensitive to the assumptions that you make regarding your use case, both in terms of your use profile and also in terms of the energy mix and where that's come from. So if we were to change those values, we would get quite different crossover points. And I think the other thing to think, but it does highlight maybe something else that we need to think about is the kind of, you know, if we do move towards battery electric and more plug-ins and more hybrids, we're potentially increasing the environmental impact of suited vehicle production. And we do need to have an idea of how far you need to travel before you pay that back, which then comes back to, well, how much do you use your car? So I'm going to confess, I've only got a little car. I've got a little A segment. I don't do a big mileage maybe 10,000 kilometres in a year if you're lucky. And let's face it, at the moment, it's barely done 200, maybe certainly haven't done more than 300 miles in the last three or four months. So it would take me a little while before I effectively paid back my environmental impact by maybe switching to a battery electric. And um, which does make me, I confess at the moment, think twice until I know that these numbers come a lot closer. So just to conclude, what we in Ricardo believe really strongly is that we need to adopt a life cycle philosophy to meet the challenges of delivery transport. So as we accelerate towards net zero, um, we need to make sure that we're thinking about sustainability in its widest context, that it's not just environmental impact, but we're thinking about human health and also economic well-being as well. In our opinion, um, life cycle um, assessment one of along with several different processes, it provides us with an approach that enables us to undertake some more holistic analysis of the wealth, health and environmental impacts of the powertrain technology and fuels.
But we've also seen that um, OEMs and supply chains are really going to need to work together for us to help us understand more what some of those environmental impacts are associated with vehicle production and potentially also with disposal and reuse as well. Um, and I know some of that's beginning to happen already. But it does also potentially change the mobility discussion. We need to make sure that we don't just shift environmental burdens from one part of the life cycle to another or from one country to another or from one type of environmental impact to another. So at Ricardo, we today would like to advocate that we need to adopt a life cycle philosophy if we were to successfully engineer um, a future net zero transport system in the UK and beyond. Thank you um, so much for, to listen and um, for listening. There is some acknowledgements that I need to make. So some of the data that I've presented today is a tiny, tiny slither of a subset from a very big LCA project that my colleagues in energy and environment are just finishing at the moment. We did this project in collaboration with um, Euphoria and with e 4 tech as well. And it was looking at life cycle assessment applied to road transport. It covered multiple different types of vehicles from medium passenger cars, large passenger cars, trucks, buses, and um, L category. It looked all the way up to 2050. There were about 10 to 15 plus different environmental impact factors and a number of different propulsion systems as well and fuel types. Um, I think some of you may have been able to attend the stakeholder workshop that we had. I think it was around January, February time earlier this year, just before lockdown. Um, and we're hoping that the European Commission will publish the report later this year. If you'd like to know anything more about that study or anything more about some of the work at Ricardo, um, my contact details are here along with my colleagues Nick Hill and Simon Gandhi. Thank you very much for listening. And um, back to uh, Philippa and Gloria. Great, thanks Jane. Really, really interesting that. And yeah, definitely I'm, I'm hoping that we get to see some that publication of the report from the European Commission later this year. Um, so thanks everyone for all the, Q, the Q and A's that are com, questions that are coming in. Keep those coming in. We've just got time for a, a couple now um, for Jane, and then um, we will come back to some of those later um, to the panel. But really good uh, that everyone's putting those in. So I believe the first um, question is going to be asked live by um, Les Gill. Les. Hello. Good morning, Philippa. Uh, good morning, morning Jane and everybody that's online. Uh, very interesting, good to see um, um, the, the discussion opening up uh, this morning. Um, yeah, my, my general premise is, um, we all live at the moment in, um, in a kind of uh, environment where we have mass commuting. We're able to, to travel wherever and whenever. I just wonder generally if the panel are thinking that this is a future model that our children and our children's children will be thinking the same as that we've grown up with. Okay, that the, 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 the uh, car took over the horse uh, and we only use horses for recreation. And I wondered if that might be uh, a future state for the commuting passenger car, not all vehicles, but just the ones that we go and play out in every day to go backwards and forwards to work. And as we can see today, that we don't always need to go to work every day. So, um, and I'm just interested in, we're trying to find a solution to a model. Are we working on the right model of future transport? Would you like us to try and answer that right away or do you want to wait? To yeah, Jane, go on, you, you just on. sort of, and we can maybe get the, some of the other panel's um, perspectives later. Um, so we're just going to say within Ricardo, we are looking at um, alternative propulsion systems and also um, mobility as a whole as well. And there's a number of studies that we've published um, already kind of looking at that and looking, I think we did a, a looking at, if we took Paris as an example, and we thought about what the future of mobility might look like in Paris, as we're very much so going to a very um, multimodal um, world where there's lots of different options. And it's not necessarily a case of just jumping in a car. So I think we're seeing it with some of the, the kind of a pay to you schemes that are coming up. Um, I live in Brighton and Hove and like London, we've got a, a, a bike share scheme where you can kind of go and rent a, a bike by the minute um, and use it to cycle around the city. Um, there's various other places that have been looking at scooters. There's lots of other ways in which we might manage mobility in the future. And it makes it a really interesting time to think about what the engineering solutions are. And um, plus we've had the whole kind of spanner in the works of COVID-19 and where the policy might have been to encourage us to use public transport 
at the moment there's a little bit of a kind of maybe not quite public transport and um, so I'm looking forward to when we do get to back to public because um, I think you're right we don't necessarily all need to own cars we don't necessarily need to drive in cars all of the time um, but we do require much more of a holistic systems thinking approach to how we're going to solve these questions and issues so thank you for your question. Thank you. Hi Jane, got a, a question from the audience and this is a, an anonymous question so I, I'm going to ask you, um, how in your life cycle analysis do you take into account data connectivity because whilst it's a plus for IC powered engines, uh, for BEVs um, they can't nearly operate without some, la some level of data connectivity so how do you take that into account in the LCA? Um, I confess I'm not 100% sure what they did in this particular project with that. Um, I, would, I would need to take that away and check if that's okay. Okay, pick that up another time. Yeah, a good Great. question. Yeah, really interesting actually and in, in seeing how we manage that data going forward. So yeah, if you could feedback Jane, that would be great and we can share that with the attendees after the event. So lovely. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Jane. Really great start to the um, first session. I'm delighted that Jane is going to be staying with us and be on the panel later. So any other questions you have for her, she will be able to pick them up then. Um, so on our first, um, next we have uh, three speakers lined up and the first of those I'm delighted to introduce is Dr. Will Drury. Um, Will is the Challenge Director for the Driving the Electric Revolution Challenge um, and he's going to be talking to us about the UK Power Electronics Machines and Drives opportunity around this topic. Will. Fantastic, thank you Philippa. Well, uh, Jane, what a standard you've set to follow on from, so I will... Uh promise to do my best uh can't promise to live up to that uh, those expectations so some really really interesting things there and actually looking at the the granular detail of what is it that's creating the problems in our uh, ecosystem we're looking at here and what what can we do about it so today i've put together a very short overview for you on driving the electric revolution what it is what am i doing and just some thoughts that I've had in and around this really important area. So what we are trying to underpin in the Strategy Challenge Fund is clean innovation and green economic recovery. And I think historically, a lot of this has been sort of focused on exactly what the tailpipe emissions. And I read what Philippa had put on like, are we as a nation focused on tailpipe emissions? And a lot of the focus is there, but it's actually the whole thing. So within what we're looking at, we are looking at the full innovation chain from where does it come from through to how do we reuse it at the end? But it's got to be done in a way that still creates economic benefit to doing that. Businesses do not invest in things that are non-economically viable so it's got to be an economic benefit but it can be and should be this should be at the forefront and maybe that at, at times needs some incentives to do that but what are we looking at we are an industrial strategy challenge i'm employed by uk research and innovation so we we provide funding to look at activities driving the electric revolution is all about power electronics, machines and drives, and growing that supply chain. And I'll touch on that in a minute. We have 80 million pounds invested by the government through BASE, the uh, Business Energy and Industrial Strategy Department of the government launched last year. And we're looking at resilient supply chains and jobs in the UK. If we nail that, we will grow this sector. And I will quite happily debate with anyone the delivery of net zero is reliant on this type of technology. Whether it's a wind turbine converting wind to electricity and putting it on the grid, whether it's electric vehicles using that energy to provide a zero emission um, opportunity. We are looking at that breadth. And we talk about power electronics machines and drives and they're everywhere. Across vehicles, whether it's a future fully electric vehicle, whether it's a hybrid vehicle, or whether it's a 
conventional vehicle these components are there power electronics whether it's silicon silicon carbide gallium nitro they all have to be made ingots grown sliced diced doped what chemicals are needed and i think that we can talk about the carbon element of life cycle analysis very very easily but then there's bringing that out into what what chemicals are used how is it transported all of those things start to add together machines where does the copper come from steel laminations before we touch on magnets that are very much at the forefront of life cycle analysis style things and drives finally packaging these providing intelligence in automotive there's a big drive for integration which is great news from a life cycle analysis reducing the number of packages that we have in there reducing the number of different and discrete boxes that are around will reduce cabling, reduce connectors, reduce plastics, but also reduce any of those enclosure and metal that is again adding to the life cycle analysis of, uh, of these things. So we cover all of these, including the software. We talk about how efficient something is. The software has a huge part to play in that. So I think that when we talk about life cycle analysis, we need to bear in mind there are many things that are going to drive that decision and by increasing efficiency through better more optimized software we're also able to change those graphs that Jane showed us earlier on the impact because we can start to make things less energy intensive within the challenge that we're looking at we're not just looking at automotive this is not an automotive only concern issue this covers all the sectors that are looking at electronics power electronics, machines and drives, whether it's industrial electronics, robotics, energy, marine, it doesn't matter, it's the same challenge. How do we recycle? How do we reduce the waste at the end of this? And it is an all-encompassing thing. It started off a decade or so two ago, looking at the WE directive, how do we reduce electronic waste? What is the directive? What, are the, what is the onus? with a almost carrot or carrot to do something about it, but the stick of you have to do this from the uh, European legislation. That started a big drive towards the recycling of electronics. And I think we talk about recycling a lot, but we've got to look at this. How can we reduce this? We support things across this whole environment from raw material through to the system integration. And I think the chart, Jane, that you showed on the uh, uh, engine manufacturer was really interesting and is the sort of thing that I, I don't have the answer on the motor, but I'd be really interested to see how does that change when we start looking at an electrified powertrain. Where is the energy? Is it what we've got here in the left hand side of the raw material, mining that, refining it, turning that into powder that can be used within a magnet to make a magnet? to put in the motor and then into the uh, overall electric axle. How does that fit together? What happens about the power electronics? How much energy we're going to move? We all want to look at silicon carbide as the next generation power electronics. Great. What's the delta in energy needed to make silicon carbide to silicon or gallium nitride, if that's the answer? How does that feed into this life cycle analysis? It might be more efficient. It might reduce things in the life, but if it takes significantly more energy in the manufacture, where does the break even point come? I think that's interesting. And we talked, Jane's laid out very much the life cycle analysis and the process innovation. So within our challenge, we're looking at the process development, the manufacturing, the supply chain growth, and how we then recycle or even reuse things reduce the material needed in the first place is always going to be the best option in this but it's then a trade-off and one thing i think that is really important is also the corporate social responsibility within this life cycle analysis can we look at the two together so we're not just looking at the carbon and the environmental impact but we're looking at where things come from what the impact of where they come from on our world is that can't be measured in CO2 emissions, bringing all that together gives us a real life cycle assessment product and 
all of that holistically across all sectors. Automotive is a fast growing element of this, but across all sectors, how does it play? And is it different in different sectors? Some sectors may well need to do this faster. And that will depend very much as Jane talked about on duty cycle and usage. But it does come all the way through to how's it packaged? How's it distributed? How much energy is used to recycle it? If I can get 99% recycled, but it's using a huge amount of energy, when's, when's that trade-off decision made? And is that actually dependent on where the energy comes from in the first place? If it's clean energy, you have a different metric to it being made from a coal power station. And is this what we want? This really interesting article on the BBC website on uh, neodymium or deprosium uh, man mining. And this is one of the lakes in China. Is this, we talk about carbon dioxide emissions. Is this what we want as a runoff lake? for the permanent magnets we have in this world? Or is there a better, more sustainable, environmentally friendly, in the holistic sense of the word, way of doing it? I know where my hat's on on that one. But if anyone wants to read it, really, really interesting article there on BBC. When I finish talking, I will post that link into the chat window for you. What are we doing about it though? So, Philip asked me just sort of what, what's happening about this. Well, we currently have an open competition through Innovate UK. And one of the four key themes is circular economy. We have brought that out into one of our main themes within the supply chain of PMD that we're looking to grow here. Circular economy, LCA, how do we make this more sustainable overall is a key pillar to the future. Developing manufacturing without consideration of that without looking at how that's going to impact and without looking at what the user is going to want in the future is going to be a real challenge and it is that that I think is of real interest across the sectors and specifically given the growth of this area that is forecast in the automotive sector. Anyone's interested? please submit an application. Eligibility and all information is available online. Um, so I'm also aware that I was given a 10 minute slot, Philippa. I am known to overrun, but I will stick to 10 minutes to the dot. Say thank you very much. Please engage with us if you are interested in this area. We are very focused on the PMD supply chain as opposed to focus on automotive, but we can therefore look at opportunities in other sectors with you. So Philip, Gloria, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and join this. And hopefully that was about what you were after from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Will. That was very interesting indeed. Right, I'd like to now pass over to our, our next panelist. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Stuart Coles. He's the Associate Professor of Sustainable Materials and Manufacturing at WMG. Stuart, over to you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, thank you for, for paying attention and, and listening to the first two speakers. What wonderful talks from uh, both Jane and Will. Um, I think I might uh, be duplicating a little bit about Jane's talk, but I won't call it duplication. I'll maybe call it reinforcing the message um of what we've been doing some of the work at wmg about understanding vehicle emissions across the whole life cycle um my own background is i've been working in sustainable materials for a number of years now and uh, i went to numbers of conferences and was constantly asked about some of the materials developments that we were doing as to whether or not our uh, our new technology new materials were more environmentally sustainable was it more was it better for the environment etc and we could never really justify that and that's how i and the rest of our group at, within sustainable materials and manufacturing got involved in life cycle analysis because we really used it as a way of justifying and answering those what if questions and trying to answer some of these decision makers some of the policies around these sorts of areas and that's really where i'm going to kind of slant this sort of section of the talk today. Now, I'm very grateful for Jane for covering what an LCA is and, and not having to run through the ISO standards again. So um, we've kind of got an understanding of that, but we'll talk about the sort of like the phases 
of uh, vehicle manufacturing in general. Uh, we'll have a little bit of a focus on probably the manufacturing and the use phase uh, in this particular talk. Now, one of the areas that we that, that isn't covered on this particular slide is the design. We have to acknowledge that the uh, design phase has a huge impact on all three of these uh, particular phases. It's estimated that the design phase covers, uh, it locks in maybe sort of 75 to percent of, a, of any kind of product or processes environmental impact at the outset. So you have to get this kind of life cycle thinking approach embedded right at the start from the design phase out. But then when we think about the vehicle itself, we have to think about how it's manufactured, how it's used, and that end of life phase as well. Uh, and we, we've tried to assess all three of those to the best of our ability and, and come up with some kind of numbers that help us kind of justify why electric vehicles may or may not be uh, the, the right way forward. So with manufacturing, we've kind of covered it a lot already in some areas, um, but manufacturing a battery has more carbon emissions associated with a comparable internal combustion engine. That's kind of the numbers that are being borne out by literature. It's kind of what we've, we've discussed already this morning. But if you think about it from a conceptual point of view, batteries are complicated products. You've got active materials embedded in anodes and cathodes. You've got electrolytes. Um, you've got battery management systems. There's a whole heap of different parts that go into making a making a battery. Lots of different materials, lots of different complex processes, and so it's only uh, to be expected that a battery has more carbon emissions associated with it. So we this is something that we we understand. Now, when we look at the whole vehicle. Varying numbers in the literature tend to uh, vary, but that's probably largely due to the fact that they're modeling different vehicle systems, different uh, size vehicles, A, A group, B group, C group, etc., and looking at which one of those they're modeling. But if you take a general trend, around 33 to maybe double the amount of emissions from a battery uh, powered vehicle when compared with. Uh, an internal combustion engine so we're looking at more and that's and that's the kind of the general trend is that making a battery in the manufacturing stage it takes more carbon emissions more energy to do that first stage than uh, the comparable vehicles and so we have to understand firstly where those impacts are some of the work that we've done has suggested initially that a lot of the energy and the carbon emissions are involved in the active material uh, so things like your lithium, the energy emissions involved in the production of the lithium, um, transition metals, if you've got NMC chemistry, so nickel, manganese, cobalt. Uh, but there are other there are other ones as well. And it, it also very, depends on the type of car that you're doing, where your location is, what the supply chain is. You've got transportation between sites. There's a, there's a big range of variables that you have to consider. And it's very, very much a case by case basis as to how you're going to come up with those numbers so the absolute values are really only relevant for a specific case but the trend is clear is that making batteries costs us more in terms of engine uh, in terms of energy and in terms of carbon emissions and then if we move to the use phase where does that as we've already mentioned where does that balance out where is that crossover point and we have been focused as a society on the emissions from the tailpipe for a number of years. I, if you think about legislation, we, uh, legislation has been uh, moved to cover um, to end exhaust emissions. Um, P, uh, manufacturers have been asked to drive down their emissions. Users of the cars get taxed in the UK based on their emissions. So the use phase has always been based and it's been very prominent around what comes out and so this is why electric vehicles have created a uh, a number of uh, a number of uh, a number of benefits because they are zero emission at the point of use there has no there, there is no carbon emitted and that's great from a local environment perspective if you've got heavy traffic and the, you're reducing emissions there's not just carbon there's nox emissions as well but you're creating that making that local environment just that little bit better but of course, we are potentially shifting that problem because electricity generation 
has related carbon emissions. We have so we have, we have to consider what those emissions are from making that electricity in the first place. What sort of electricity are we generating, and so on. Um, but when we start to do those comparisons, as Jane's already shown, and I'll show some crossover graphs as well, uh, the, the comparison with internal heat, uh, combustion engines using a UK grid mix is actually pretty favorable. So this is some modeling we've done at WMG. And again, very uh, kind of basic numbers uh, and kind of caveats all over the place in terms of what the assumptions are. But we've taken a fairly conservative case here where you can see that the manufacturing of the battery um, electric vehicle is approximately double that of the uh, internal combustion engine. And then um, based on the current grid mix, and that grid mix uh, for the 2019 average was about 220 grams um, per kilowatt hour of carbon dioxide. And then so on, and then we've got moving forward. Um, there you go. So for after that, um, from the uh, uh, for after the um, the battery has been manufactured, we then have to take into account the the emissions that are generated in use phase, so about 220 grams per kilo, kilowatt hour. That's that kind of gradient, and then um, below that we've got the internal combustion engine, and then based on a fairly standard sized car, 120 grams of carbon dioxide per kilometer, and then we see here that the crossover point is somewhere around. Uh, in this instance, 45,000 miles. If we take a, a, an average use, for, uh, average use for a car is somewhere around 10 to 12,000 miles, we're looking at somewhere around four years in terms of that kind of payback. But again, these numbers are very specific to particular cases, supply chains, locations, that all makes a difference. But one of the things that perhaps um, uh, uh, helps us we're in terms of the future of how we understand and whether this is the right thing to be doing moving forward is that um, the grid mix is currently changing. So that to average, UK grid average of 220 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour is actually relatively high. The target for the UK grid mix in 2030 is to have it down to 100 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. Now that's quite a, a substantial reduction. This morning, um, the National Grid have produced a lovely app and you can check uh, what the, uh, the, the carbon emissions are. The uh, grid mix was down to around 78 grams this morning. Um, it was particularly sunny morning. It's kind of got a bit darker now. So I imagine it's uh, picked up a little bit. The lowest um, average point on the National Grid mix um, ever recorded was uh, earlier in May and that got down to 46 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour based on our current grid mix. So an average of 100 is eminently achievable and if you put that into the graph you'll find here that 100 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour actually shifts that crossover point um, a lot closer and then you start to see it uh, that payback period comes a lot earlier because the, the embedded emissions in that use phase are considerably lower. One minute left, Stuart. After that, so the reduction in a UK grid intensity will also affect those kind of manufacturing emissions because we'll also find that if we're manufacturing and put, assembling batteries within the UK, we'll see that there's a big reduction here most of the processes that involved in carbon emission in involved in making a battery that has electricity rated uh, towards it there's lots of electrical processes in there in comparison to internal combustion engines that tend to use a lot more thermal processes we should also as well consider the end of life just quickly batteries are difficult to assemble um, they are energy and carbon uh, and emission inefficient. So there's lots of problems within those. And we don't really have much in terms of industrially relevant data to kind of cover in these particular areas. But what we can say is that because of the complexity of the battery, it's likely that if you'd make an attributional model and you attribute the recycling to the, the, the life cycle thinking of the, the battery vehicle itself, the recycling is likely to have a greater impact 
on the battery than it would do on an ICE. So those, those two lines are going to get closer together again. Um, however, if you've got more recycled material coming out, there's potential to have an impact on your manufacturing when you start. So we'll find that if you get more recycled material, then maybe there's further environmental benefits to be had here as well. But this is kind of some early stage thinking that we've coming out with, with the group. One final point is on materials. We have to have a long-term consideration around materials supply. We mentioned neodymium, dysprosium already, cobalt, other critical raw materials. If we don't mitigate them this, the, in terms of recycling, these materials are going to become in short supply. So we need some kind of better legislation in order to drive that um, process because of the co cost and uh, carbon inefficiencies. If we think of the legislation in terms of target recycling, 50% um, of the battery needs to be recycled, but that's by mass, and it doesn't include any of the critical raw materials. So just to quickly summarize, larger proportion of the environmental impact is associated with manufacturing of an electric vehicle battery. Um, if we increase the energy density, that will improve as well as infrastructure. The, en the electric vehicle itself is better um, for pretty much anything other than a very low mileage vehicle. And as the, the grid carbon intensity drops, that case just strengthens as well. And just finally, we need to consider the materials impact as well. Um, and as, the, as I said, the battery recycling directive needs to be more challenging than 50% by mass. Um, just a number of references there that we've used to put some of this data together. And I must give credit to Jonathan, Matthew, Martin and Dave, who've been working with us uh, on a number of different projects related to this kind of work within WMG. And I'd like to thank you all for your attention and welcome any questions as and when they arise. Thanks, Stuart. Really great. Um, in, in the essence of time, we're going to move swiftly on um, to Claire Davis. So Professor Claire Davis um, is a Tata Steel Professor of Thermomechanical Processing at WMG. Um, Claire is going to talk to us about reducing the carbon intensity of metal alloys. All right, thank you very much. Um, so in terms of following on from some of the things that we've heard about um, already this morning, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the metal alloys used in vehicles, so moving away a little bit from propulsion systems but thinking about the whole of the vehicle. We've um, heard a little bit about the, the LCA analysis and the importance of being able to look through from production to use phase. I'm going to focus on production phase for vehicles and talk a little bit about where things are for um, the dominant materials, which is steel and aluminium that are used in the um, vehicle frames. And I want to talk a little bit about the inherent energy and carbon costs of the, the material through um, the production and transportation phases. A little bit about where uh, things are going with regard to new technologies that might improve um, production technologies to give lower energy and carbon costs. Um, and talk about light weighting and also a little touch upon some of the issues we've already heard a bit about, which is recycling and really design um, philosophies, not just for the assembly, but actually disassembly, reuse and remanufacture, which I think is going to become a more and more important part of considerations for LCAs. So I'll put a lot of information there and, and I'll try and summarise it so we don't worry about all the detail. but. In terms of the um, basic material costs, then steel and aluminium are the primary materials that are used. And for both materials, we can compare primary uh, metal production and um, secondary, which is where we use a lot more scrap. So in the UK, we have both integrated blast furnace production routes and we have electric arc furnace, which takes a much higher proportion of scrap. However, the electric arc furnace scrap melting um, process is not suitable for all steels that are used in um, the automotive, particularly automotive body, body panels. Um, so when we look at the, the balance between the energy and here I've got CO2 costs, then obviously a higher scrap content route would be preferable for the recycling, but it's not necessarily always feasible. And I'll touch upon why in, in a little bit. You'll note that I put um, values, well, a range of values for um, aluminium production, and that's because it really does depend where the aluminium is being produced as to what energy source is being used 
um, for the consequence on CO2 production. So it can be quite, quite lean, it can be quite high. But you'll note that generally speaking, it, they're, they're not aluminium production, primary production is not particularly good in terms of um, carbon, uh, but secondary by using scrap is much, much more efficient. Um, and we have some issues there about how, how that might be done. Um, but really to give you a, a flavour for where people are looking in the industry, there's a lot of work being done um, globally on low energy and low carbon um, production processes. And I've just picked out um, two examples here. Uh, they're not necessarily the best examples, but just to give you a flavour of it. So for example, with steel production, well, I was talking before about tonnes of CO2 per tonne of steel. Here, please note we're down to um, kilograms. So hugely um, different in terms of the embedded carbon for production of steel because it is uses hydrogen as the reductant rather than coke. Um, at the moment, this is at pilot plant um, stage uh, being done in Sweden, being funded mostly out of EU uh, project grants. So big changes potentially for steel production. Um, problem there will be... Uh, taking it on board across the, the world because as we heard before it's got to be sustainable and economic and with um, steel production there's a lot of infrastructure cost and so changing infrastructure would be very expensive. But there are technologies that are being introduced in aluminium. I show here the Alcoa uh, micro mill which uh, reduces the energy costs and CO2 costs but also time. It, it goes from something that um, was about 20 days of conventional heat treatment rolling down to, well, they, they talk about 20 minutes, but you can certainly go for less than a day. So huge savings across the board. It's not just the production phase, it's also then about transport. We, certainly in my area, I'm a steel metallurgist, we, we often overlook this. We did a little bit of um, work just looking at a a particular supply chain, not for automotive um, grade material, but a supply chain looking at internal UK production of um, steel and steel slab being transferred um, to the rolling facility as compared to buy-in of overseas slab and um, rolled and then transported to the customer. And as you can see, there's actually a reasonably significant amount of CO2 costs just purely from the transportation. And these were real scenarios that we did some um, work on. I'll note that there's no, currently, no UK production of primary al aluminium. So there is always going to be transportation costs. Um, and really for full LCA, it's not just the embedded uh, cost of the material, it's also those um, transportation costs because it can quite quickly add up. A little bit more about um, where things are going in the future, then light weighting to make the whole um, in use phase more efficient is uh, always a, an increasing focus for the metals industry. And I just put two examples here, one for steels, one for aluminium. These are again for body parts um, and moving towards light weighting of structures. And what I'm trying to show here is that we have families of materials, both in the steels and the aluminium alloys, um, where everybody is pushing to get higher strength with good ductility. So we can then use these higher performing materials in um, component parts. If they're higher performing, we can use less of them to get the same overall performance in the design and therefore give light weighting. And this will continue to, to be a push in terms of the um, body structures. Actually, I'm, I'm a steel metallurgist, but when we compare aluminium and steel, I, I'm very much a believer it's the right material in the right place, that there are places where steels are the required material because their uh, actual strength values are much, much higher than aluminium. But here's a nice example that shows when you go for specific properties, then you get a lot of comparability. And in some cases, the aluminium will be uh, a better material than the steel for a given particular application, depending on whether it's strength limited or stiffness limited, for example. So if we're going to go for the right material for the right component, then a consequence of that is dissimilar joining. Um, and this is for assembly, but I'll make the point now and I'll come back to it, that disassembly is equally as important. 
that where we use one material, it's much easier to then, um, for example, shred and um, recycle. When we're using two different, very different materials, then it's difficult for the disassembly and the recycling or reuse part of a vehicle life. But we also actually have to consider the full assembly part and look at different types of joining technologies. Um, if we take the example at the top where we're using aluminium to steel um, with a conventional uh, type of welding approach, then actually you get uh, very specific technical problems, in this case the formation of intermetallics, and therefore you get joint failure. So we do have to think about um, light weighting and the right material, but also design and design consequences to make sure that we, we get fit for purpose. Coming then on to recycling, I've already mentioned about uh, secondary material um, in the recycling chain. Uh, but what I'd like to talk about here really is about the supply chain for recycling. So in the UK, we produce a lot of steel ferrous scrap. Most of that is exported. Um, we use a fraction of it. We actually import some um, scrap as well. End of vehicles, end of use vehicles comprise quite a lot of the scrap. So if we want to use more scrap, then we need to consider the implications of that in the supply chain. And one of the implications is the build-up of um, residual elements that we don't want because they affect the quality of the material. So we need better improve, better sourcing of scrap material and more closed loop recycling. I, I've put this up as a just as an illustration. What this shows is the accumulation of copper in steel with the number of recycle cycle numbers so it depends on the lifetime of the component that we're looking at as to what the, the actual time frame is this is just a cycle time and depending on whether we're doing it fully by blast furnace route or by an electric arc furnace route or a hybrid between them the important factor here is that the copper accumulates in the steel as we recycle and if, if we have a upper limit because of processability and, and so the quality of the material then we have to be concerned about when we might reach that and therefore what mix of primary metal um, and secondary metal and scrap recycling we can accommodate within um, the industry. Likewise with the aluminium um, side of things. It's a, a similar type of story in the sense that recycling is extremely important uh, but we do need the technologies for sorting the material so that we get clean material going into the recycling so we can um, reuse many times and not uh, reuse at a downgraded product line. So there are sorting technologies here. I, I mentioned LIBS for compositional sorting because aluminium is a more expensive material that the sorting technologies are actually more advanced for um, aluminium than they probably are for steels. But also closed loop recycling from fabricators is extremely important. And I put a quote in there uh, about how um, fabricating off cuts, if you like, the scrap that's coming from that directly returned into the supply chain means that um, you don't have to then dilute the material because you know exactly what the quality is that goes through. And that's a very important factor. I also then want to just touch a little bit on um, the disassembly and reuse for the full um, LCA for a materials perspective in the vehicle. And we really ought to consider the design for recycle which we've talked about but actually design of component parts for reuse and I know uh, you know Stuart would be able to talk about it a lot more than I that things like the batteries there is the recycling of batteries but there is also second life of batteries where it may no longer be suitable for vehicles but it might be suitable for other forms of um, energy storage in, in other scenarios so again that uh, reuse um, and indeed, for things like steels, we could talk about remanufacture as well. And this is starting to happen within the industry. And um, here I show an example, not for um, automotive, but for vehicles. Uh, and this came from a piece of work that was published this year about uh, going through an LCA and a cost analysis on um, disassembly, reuse, and remanufacture for steel components um, in these types of, of vehicles. And so in uh, yellow goods and heavy goods and um, such vehicles, this type of approach is, is being used. It's used quite a lot um, in the construction industry as well, 
where um, reuse has become much more of a, um, a thought process in their design. So just to summarise, uh, I've talked about a number of aspects that are important for the materials in um, vehicle and particularly when we want to look at LCA and low carbon low energy. There are opportunities for lowering the embodied energy or CO2 contribution in um, vehicles uh, and for me some of those include things like closed loop recycling, continuing thrusts for light weighting um, but also aspects such as reuse and remanufacture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, I'd like now, now I'd like to ask uh, the panellists if they could all come back onto the stage. And what we're going to do now is have some questions from our audience. We've had quite a few. We'll, we'll kick off. So I'd very much like um, Sophie glazer Jurel. apologies if I've pronounced your, your surname wrong. Would you like to, uh, to raise a question, please? For Hi, yeah, I guess this mainly affects what Stuart, Will and Jane were saying. Um, this shift away from tailpipe emissions uh, analysis alone, with a closer look at life cycle analysis, is this uh, indicative of a move away from putting a responsibility on consumers to buy clean cars, to have additional taxes for older cars, needing to replace and update elements of their existing cars at high cost, being shifted slowly onto the producers. And secondly, given the emissions scandals and the fluffing of numbers from big automotive companies, can we trust vehicle manufacturers to report accurately on these full spectrum emissions? That's two um, very good questions. Um, I think coming to your, your first question regarding is this sort of pushing, you know, um, emphasis away from consumers. I think it's a case of we need both. So we do need consumers to be thinking carefully about what purchases they choose to make and what vehicles they choose to use. Um, I don't think we could, yeah, and we need, but we possibly also need to help them understand um, some of these trade-offs. So maybe provide, providing them with that information that they can make in a more informed decision and also get help and support in terms of what vehicle is going to be most appropriate for them in terms of how they want to use it. Because let's face it, we've all got different um, use profiles even within ourselves you know some are maybe a family of six and they need a bigger vehicle some of us are on our own and we could probably get away with a smaller vehicle etc so um i think i don't think moving to lca means that we then say the consumers have no responsibility they do it's just making sure that we think about things more holistically um, and consumers are already beginning to be aware of this as well so they're going to want information i'll invite my fellow panelists to provide some comments well, I think um, it's a very valid point. At the moment, you're um, certainly in the UK. What the people in at the moment are being taxed on is tailpipe emissions. What if that tax moved away to carbon content of the vehicle, or and that would you could say, well, how you make electricity is very dependent on that. I agree, but there's got to be some way of tying it back. It's got to be an incentive. The current generation are very environmentally friendly. I've had the joy of going for a walk up the hill next to my house in Hertfordshire and being able to see London from here because there's been no pollution. But I think the next generation are acutely aware of that. I think there will be a mindset in the people, but also there's going to have to be some form of stick to go with the carrot. What that stick, I think that there is a, a number of people around that will be, be driving that policy. But it will be that blend of people wanting to do it because they can see the benefits and laying those out as Jane. But also, I think there will need to be some form of encouragement, let's say. I, I would agree. I, I think there definitely needs to be both the, the kind of the stick and the carrot uh, in terms of moving, moving this forward. I think in terms of the responsibility definitely doesn't absolve com consumers of responsibility at all. People need to be aware of what they're purchasing and uh, the sort of like the decisions that they're making. I do think though that using this more whole life cycle approach does allow producers to be more aware of the types of material that they're using, the types of uh, products that are going out 
and it maybe allows them to identify areas where they can make some environmental savings in terms of their manufacturing profile as we've seen from the graphs that it does have a, a reasonably large proportion of the overall environmental impact if we look at this whole whole cycle so if there then if there is some kind of stick um, that is related to carbon emissions of the whole content then perhaps having manufacturers then looking at these individual parts and maybe we can save a bit off the the active material or something from the electrolyte to kind of round that picture off I think that the the use of the the whole uh, the whole life cycle tool is a, is a good way forward. Thanks, guys. Um, Claire, have you got anything that you'd like to add into that discussion just before we go to the next question? Oh, no, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, just check. Um, Greg Archer, I believe you've got a question. Uh, good morning. Um, all the presentations until Claire's focused on battery emissions being higher uh, than um, the equivalent emissions for constructing the, the, the ICE vehicle. But of course, they didn't take account of the likelihood of, of a second life for that battery, for example, in, in power storage. And when the production emissions are amortized over the full life cycle of the battery, uh, then the LCA element for the car is, is much lower. So I'd like to hear from the panel how much difference you think that would make uh, to the overall uh, LCA emissions of a battery vehicle compared to an ICE. Well, um, yeah, um, I, the I mean it does reduce it, but it also depends on how you build your LCA model. So where whereabouts do you draw your the goal and your scope? Do you look uh, primarily at, at that battery as a, as a kind of a functional unit? Or are you looking at a product or a process or how, how you go, and go about scoping those areas? Does it reduce the, the overall environmental impact of that particular battery? Yeah, absolutely. If you stretch it out over a, a, second, uh, a second life, then it does, it does make a, a, a difference and it probably helps strengthen the case for the use of the batteries. Um, in terms of actual numbers, I don't have a, a feeling for what those numbers would be because creating those kind of LCA models is incredibly complex and we've you know we've barely got a handle on what that recycling reuse case is what I would say is that um, we know from waste hierarchy that reuse is better than recycling you know it is going to be better for the environment if we can keep these materials in service and when batteries are at their end of life in a first life in terms of automotive applications there's still quite a lot of capacity in there there's still perfectly good um, uh, materials um, to, to perfectly good products to be then used. Um, my first PhD student uh, PhD was about second life batteries in rural uh, in rural India. Um, so there's, there's, some, there's quite a lot of data that we've got um, around the potential. Um, so yeah, I think it would. It does make a better case in the long term. It's not something I've got. Uh background or experience on so uh, I'm, I don't feel like I'm able to add any more than what Stuart said. The only thing that I would add is that it becomes critical to have the appropriate supply chains in place because what we're talking about is a nice um, theoretical example but actually it really requires the supply chains to make it um, actually happen. A third question now uh, from the panel, and I'd like to, to introduce um, Amy Peace, if you'd like to raise your questions to the panellists, please. Hi, yes, it's Amy Peace from uh, Innovate here, and I was interested to kind of see some of the views you've had about um, these LCAs and sustainability evaluations you used to sort of help people make better decisions to see the trade-offs. But we saw those kind of two graphs showing just CO2 for where the overlap is. Um, which could help people make the decision on whether um, electric vehicles are right for them and perhaps discouraging those who have low mileage. But as, as Will's already flagged, you know, for people who do low mileage often be in sort of towns and cities and for them, localised pollution, particulates, NOx is perhaps a bigger driver for them switching to electric vehicles. So do you have kind of data visualisations showing those trade-offs which might make the case for those um, low uh, mileage cases? We have the data, we haven't necessarily done it as a trade-off. So as I alluded to previously, that my colleagues have been doing for DG Klima, 
and has considered lots of different environmental impacts, including those associated with air quality. So basically we could repeat um, something like I, I did today, um, but looking at those other environmental impacts, we haven't yet done that. And I don't, it certainly wasn't part of the, the current project that's just finished. Um, if that's something that you're interested in, then feel free to get in contact with me and we can have a chat. But they are based on theoretical vehicles. Just to, to kind of add to that, um, the, the LCA data that we show, we, we did focus on, on carbon emissions, but there it's, the, it's actually carbon equivalents. Um, so the, the little term is CO2E. Um, so the NOx emissions actually get grouped into that category. Um, uh, so, you, so you'll find the NOx emissions there. There's also another impact category around particulate matter that we, that we haven't shown the data that we, we've got there. But again, we haven't looked at it as a crossover point but also as well one of the problems with the L with lca in this particular instance is that particulate matter has a bigger impact depending on where you are um, and the lca doesn't take necessarily take that into into account so the you know particulate matter in the middle of london is a lot different to a, a small amount of particulate matter that's emitted out in the countryside so it, it's just, that crossover point necessarily isn't quite necessarily as helpful as, as we as we might have hoped but it certainly is something you should be looking at. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, guys. Um, I think we've got time just for one more question. Um, I believe Robert Powell is going to ask a question. Great. Thanks. Really interesting talk. Um, I, I had one question about that. A lot of the models are, are based on when you're looking at the raw materials. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in, in the impact associated with raw material production. And it can vary significantly based on, say, for example, where lithium is sourced, whether it's from the Atacama or whether it's from hard rock deposits in Australia. Uh, how do you incorporate that uncertainty into the modelling? And how do you think we're going to, moving forward, we're going to in incorporate specific supply chain routes in, into these models? And I, that's directed to everybody, really. So <laughs> I was going to say, it's. Um, I think that it, that's that sits across whether it's lithium in batteries or rare earths going into machines or anything else. I think that it's really, really important. And it also, I think, ties into one of the earlier questions about what becomes the consumer's responsibility and what is a um, manufacturer's responsibilities. The manufacturer's responsibilities will be to look and there's got to be an incentive to look for the lowest embedded environmental impact whether that's carbon whether that's some of the things that i showed on the picture for magnets um that's got to be driven from the and there's got to be a reason for oems to drive that tier ones to drive that style of procurement there needs to be a different vision of procurement and a reason to do that so it is not a bottom-up um, type procurement activity it considers where the material comes from because if the embedded carbon within what that magnet let's let's and i acknowledge the questions around you keep coming back to carbon it's an easy thing to grab a handle on so i'm going to come back to it the embedded carbon in that magnet is less if we buy it from this place than that place then there's got to be a benefit to doing that and i see that's potential route to driving procurement supply chains but it is absolutely critical that this is driven through the supply chain to the bottom, not pontificated about at the top of the supply chain. Anyone else? Uh, in terms of the in terms of data, yes, we you have to we've in terms of our models, we've picked a specific point. So we we've said uh, you know we're going to mine up, get our lithium from here. We we've, we're going to we built a kind of theoretical supply chain based on what is our you know what we believe to be the most likely point. Um, as for moving forward, it's actually um, one of our ongoing projects is to develop um, uh, a tool that allows you to change your supply chain and get get numbers pulled out of it. Um, so by having, uh, by saying, instead of wanting to get my lithium from, uh, you know, central Southern America, we'll get it from Australia. This then has an a change of environmental impact. So you'll be able to compare the numbers, uh, moving forward, but it, it does have to be done as a comparative basis. You will have to run a model where you know what your supply chain is, change 
a point or series of points on that supply chain and then run another model, do the comparison and kind of build it from there. is the question that it's um it's running a kind of a kit of a couple of alternative scenarios and seeing what kind of sensitivity that has on the end results which is what we've been doing in Ricardo with our study for DG Klima um, and there'll be more when, when the report gets published hopefully later this year. Thank you Jane. Right we've, we're, we're nearing midday now so um, I'd like to really thank our panellists for an absolutely fascinating morning, some really interesting um, topics there and just shows the complexity um, of what we're dealing with and thank you very much again for, for coming today and to the audience. Philippa. Yeah, thanks. Just to, to reiterate those thanks and thanks to the audience um, and for all the qu questions that we've had come through. We will try and filter through those and if we can get any responses out to you, um, we will do. I'd um, like to remind you we're running these events all week. Um, so tomorrow's is looking about um, the sustainability of the entire supply chain in terms of access to some of those raw materials. Um, I think Ilana has put a, a, a link in, in, the, in the chat, so feel free to join there um, and also we've got a survey after this session so please take the time uh, to fill that in it should only take you um, a minute or so it's very short um, but to get your feedback so thanks again to the panelists thanks to all the audience um, and we hope that you all stay safe and well thank you thanks